So Lamar Bliss is back for her second appearance. Um, she did her first talk here last fall, so now she's a seasoned professional. <laughs> Um, so Lamar is not from Canton, but her family has deep roots in Canton and the surrounding towns. She visited her grandparents, Dwight and Carmetta Church, every summer as a child, and then attended St. Lawrence University. Eventually, she returned to the area to live. She knew SLCHA had collections of her grandfather's work. He was a well-known photographer and pilot who specialized in picture postcards, and you may have heard of the... Um, his uh, photo company, um, which we actually did, uh, our past talk was about. So this talk is not about Dwight specifically, though he will be mentioned. So among the pictures and letters that Dwight Church wrote was a folder that had very few things in it. Uh, there was an official looking certificate, a ticket good for a free lunch, and a picture of Dwight receiving a bag of something from a group of people. The certificate had something to do with National Airmail Week in 1938. So this is what started this all. Lamar got curious, started digging deeper into those files, and this talk came to be. Um, and I will mention we have a little pop-up exhibit over here. These are all things from our collection related to National Airmail Week. So it's actually falling on the exact same days as it did 85 years ago in 1938. So May 15th through 21st, 1938 was the very first time that air took, that mail took to the skies. Um, and St. Lawrence County celebrated that event, participated in that event, as did the entire country. Um, so we have some cache envelopes, some covers from different periods of time in air mail from across the county. Um, the very image that you will see again of Dwight Church handing over that mystery package. Um, some pictures of his plane that he delivered the mail in, as well as a quarterly article um, that came out um, in 1994 related to Ogdensburg specifically in air mail. So please feel free to take a look at all that information later. Without further ado, Lamar Bliss. <laughs> It's so great to see so many familiar faces in the audience today. Uh, like Carleen said, the events that we're going to be looking at today happened exactly 85 years ago. So all morning long I've been thinking about the different things that my grandfather and was doing this day 85 years ago and what was happening in all the different towns around the county. So it's really great to get to share this on this particular day with you guys. If you happen to have been alive 85 years ago and you were in the Canton School Band, you got up early that morning, you had your uniform pressed, you had your shoes polished, you had your instrument out, you were at school extra early because by about quarter of eight you were already lined up to head down to the post office and march right down Court Street. And if you were the postmaster, Grace Sullivan, you were at the post office early that morning making sure that every last letter that was postmarked airmail was in a special bag that was going to be driven, paraded out to the airport and put in the airplane for the very first <laughs> airmail flight from Canton, New York. And if you were at the White Church, the pilot who had agreed to, to, to being part of this escapade, you were definitely out at the airfield early that day. You wanted to make sure that there was the right amount of oil in your engine, that the radiator was topped off with water, and that the gas tank was full. You listened to the engine hum for a little bit to make sure it sounded just the way you wanted it to, and everything was good to go. So meanwhile, in downtown Canton, the band came marching up Court Street and got to the brand new post office building. And when they arrived there, they found that there was already a group of shopkeepers and local folks, professionals and village folks, who had all come out before 8 o'clock to see the airmail leave the post office. So the band played a couple of tunes, of course, to entertain the crowd. And uh, the dignitaries all arrived, the mayor, Ward Hamilton, Postmaster Grace Sullivan with the airmail pouch, Along with her, the heads of the VFW, the American Legion, the Chamber of Commerce. We also had folks from the Rotary Club. Everybody arrived with their cars, 
the band got loaded into a big truck because there was no way they would march all the way out to the airfield. But they loaded everybody up into the truck. They headed down Main Street. They drove past the old town hall. And at the end of Main Street, they went up the road towards Ogdensburg. And very shortly, they took a left-hand turn onto the old DeKalb Road. <laughs> and um, there, they noticed that they could already see cars lining both sides of the road. And in the distance, you could see a crowd of people and Dwight Church with his plane. And so they got the band, they got all the dignitaries to the airfield, and they went ahead and the band came down off of the truck, they put up their instruments, they played another few tunes, and I'm fairly certain that there was at least one speech made there that day <laughs> by one of these people. And finally, the band played another tune, and the postmaster handed the sack of mail to Dwight Church. And Dwight took the sack of mail, placed it carefully in the plane, went to the front of the plane, spun the propeller, starting the engine, and he climbed into the cockpit. By 8.25 that morning, he taxied down the meadow at the Irwin Smith farm where he rented a little bit of space to park his plane. He had a hangar. This was his airstrip. So he takes off down the airstrip at 8.25. I'm pretty sure that once he got airborne, he probably circled the crowd at least once. They could all wave to it. And, uh, and he took off heading south towards Governor. It's, it's really quite a wonderful image when you think about all of your, you know, your town mates are out downtown, out, out here to see him off. The cool thing about this is that this wasn't only happening in Canton, New York. There were 1,700 pilots all across the country who were doing the same thing that Dwight was doing this morning. They picked up mail from almost 10,000 towns all across the country. Dwight himself made at least eight stops. And, and so all of these other pilots were make, making multiple stops, picking up mail in all these tiny little towns. They were traveling out of the large cities. It was, it was really kind of cool. Um, and all of this was the major event of National Air Mail Week, a week-long celebration to commemorate 20 years of air mail service and all it took to make that happen. You know, we think nothing we think nothing of air, of air travel today. You get in a plane, six and a half hours later, you're in California. Now, in 1938, that same trip was not, there was no such thing as a nonstop flight to California. It took 15 and a half hours in a plane to get from one side of the country to the other. And in 1918, it was stuff of science fiction to think about flying from New York to California. Um, in 1918, planes had only been successfully flown for about 15 years at that point. And a plane was little more than a pretty good sized engine attached to a propeller, attached to a fuselage and wings made out of probably wood and fabric keeping it as light as possible to get folks up in the air safely and get them back down on the ground safely. So planes in 1918, when the first airmail flight took place, they were very, very bare bones. The pilots, um, the pilots had no navigation system. You took a look at what was on the ground and that guided you from point A to point B. And this was true in 1918 as well. The pilots had to find rivers, they had to find roads, they had to find lakes, whatever they could find to navigate their way from one point to another. In uh, 1918, in January, the uh, Air Service Journal had an article on the front page, and it was called Practical Hints on Flying. My favorite hint was number 11. Never forget that the engine may stop. <laughs> Keep this always in mind. <laughs> okay. Well, there was one man who was incredibly interested in this new invention of the airplane, and that was the Postmaster General. His name was Frank Hitchcock. Frank Hitchcock was interested enough that in 1910, he actually went for a ride in one of these very flimsy, the engine may stop type of airplanes. But he was more convinced than ever at the end of that ride 
This was the way mail was going to be moved from town to town in the country. This was going to be the fastest way to do it. He was sold on the idea, and this was in 1910. So what he started doing was organizing demonstrations at fairs and at carnivals and at air shows, showing how carrying the mail by plane could get things to you a lot faster. And this paid off because by 1916, Congress appropriated $50,000 for the post office to continue their airmail experiment. And within a couple of years, the Postmaster General said, we can do it. We can do regular airmail service. Now, the problem with regular airmail service was the regularity of it. Pilots didn't want to fly in bad weather. Yeah, you go up in a plane on a good day. You didn't go up in a bad day. But to be a regular service, they had to overcome that with uh, continued training and, uh, I don't know, chutzpah, basically. So the post office said, OK, we can do at least this airmail route. The route was going to be between New York City and Washington, DC. And they had to go by way of Philadelphia. Why? Airplanes didn't hold that much gas. You had to go to Philadelphia, fill your tank, and then fly on to Washington, D.C., or the other way around. So on a morning in May in 1918, one pilot took off from Belmont Park in Long Island, and another pilot took off from the Washington Polo Grounds in Washington, D.C. The pilots were to fly to Philadelphia, refuel, and then go on to their end cities. Well, the pilot at Belmont Park had no problem, got up in the air, flew to Philadelphia, refueled, flew to Washington, D.C. And the pilot in Washington, D.C., who had the President of the United States in attendance at his takeoff, along with leaders from Congress, well, he got up in the air just fine, no problem. He flew around for a little bit. He couldn't find a landmark. He flew around a little bit more. Still, no landmark. So after about 15 minutes, he said, I got to land, I've got to ask directions. <laughs> and so in the course of landing, the plane was damaged, and he was unable to continue his flight at that point. But at least one plane made it from point A to point B, and the post office has said, success. <laughs> so, now, of course, the Postmaster General's vision was transcontinental airmail service, not just New York to DC. And this had to be done over the next three years. They took off one bite at a time. First of all, they went from New York to Cleveland. In order to do that, they had to stop in Belfont, Pennsylvania to refuel. So they had to build an air, they had to make sure they had airstrips, not only in Cleveland and in New York, Belfont, Pennsylvania needed an airstrip. And the pilots insisted that there also be emergency landing strips all along the route. So I'm sure that they were arranging with farmers all over the place. Hey, you know, we're gonna need, we might need you for a, an emergency airstrip. They got that New York to Cleveland stretch down. Then they went from Cleveland out to Chicago. Again, they had to stop in Western Pennsylvania to refuel. Uh, in another, you know, another few months, they started moving from Chicago all the way out to Omaha. Had to stop in Iowa to refuel. The last part of the journey, and this is over the course of about two, two and a half years, where they really are getting a handle on how to do this stuff. They, their last stretch went from Omaha all the way out to San Francisco. A couple of stops in Wyoming, you know, stops in a couple of different states, emergency airfields all the way along. And they managed to cobble it together. But the way that they did this, they could put air, mail on a plane in the morning. And it would fly Cleveland, Chicago, probably somewhere around Chicago, the daylight faded. They were not flying at night. There was no night flying. So at this point, they take the mail, they put it on a train. It travels overnight. In the morning, it gets to a town with an airport. They take the mail, they put it back on the plane. The plane flies. You know, by this point, maybe they're somewhere in Wyoming. So, the, so then it takes that day for the mail to go another distance, and chances are they had to put it back on the train to finish off the rest of the journey. Mm -hmm. Now, doing this was still almost a day shorter than just putting it on a train in New York and taking it off the train in California. So this was good, <sighs> not good enough. 
Congress really wanted, before they started spending more money on this experiment, they, uh, they wanted something better than just a day knocked off the amount of time. And the postmaster knew he had to get the pilots to fly at night. So just before Congress was ready to vote on a bill that was worth $1.25 million for the post office, they came up with this idea. They flew the mail out to, they got it as far as Chicago. Well, actually, in this case, they brought it east from California. About the point where it started to get dark, they'd arranged with farmers to build bonfires, <laughs> bonfires between one city and the next city. That's how those pilots found their way Wow. from that city onto the next one oh was gosh. bonfires wow. from gosh. farmers. It's, it's just, you, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> so this sold Congress on the concept, you know, maybe, maybe not bonfires, <laughs> but the post office already had something in mind. What they ended up doing was in the major airports, they constructed 50 foot, fall, 50 foot tall towers and on the top of the tower in the major airports, a beacon that was uh, bright enough, it could be seen for 150 miles by pilots. The smaller airports had towers not quite as high. Those lights were visible for about 80 miles. And just to be on the safe side through the midsection of the country where it was almost always dark when the pilots were, were flying their route, they put up every three miles they put up a small gas light, basically between Chicago and Cheyenne, Wyoming, at first, in 1923. Over the next couple of years, they expanded that both to the east and to the west. But they had a lighted highway, and no, I have no idea whose job it was to go out and light those lamps every night and make sure they had enough gas in them. But they had a lighted highway from coast to coast, basically, that the pilots were able to follow. And wow. this worked. This worked. Uh, I should mention, this is, you know, by 1924, they actually established regular service from one coast to the other. But between 1918 and 1927, 34 pilots died trying to move the mail. Can you imagine 30, losing 34 pilots, trained individuals, um, in, in the course of trying to move the mail. There were hundreds of accidents. More often than not, a pilot could walk away from an accident, but not in every case. Um, of course, all through this period, the, the plane companies are working hard to make the planes a little bit safer. The pilots continue their training to be able to fly more effectively. And um, the other thing that happened, too, was that feeder lines were brought in from southern cities up to this main east-west corridor so that mail could move from all parts of the country back and forth. However, in 1924, it still took six planes and six pilots to relay the mail from one coast to the other. Uh, we're a long way from nonstop flight from here to California. But the planes were getting bigger. Uh, they were uh, getting a little bit more comfortable for the pilots. And by 1938, the trip across the country only was 15 and a half hours long. So just as things were really starting to look good for the plane companies who were hand in hand with the post office and really, you know, the major source of funding for those plane com companies to continue with their innovations was the post office. And that was where the bulk of their money was coming from. They didn't fly passengers. The records of passengers flying at this point, they sat on the mail bags, and they were given a tin cup to pee in if they needed to, of course. So at any rate, people were traveling planes, but by the late 1920s, there was thought the planes were beefy enough now that they could handle people, and people were not quite so reluctant to fly in them. But at the end of the 20s, what hits? The Depression, and things, uh, things go badly wrong for the country as a whole. The quantity of packages and freight being moved by planes drops right off. People are not flying. They're not taking trips in airplanes. And uh, as the depression deepened, things, you know, of course got worse and worse for all the different um, industries in the, in the country. So the election of 1932 brings in Franklin Delano Roosevelt. 
He was inaugurated at the start of March, and he knew that he had to get the country back to work. He had to make sure people had paychecks and food on their tables. So the very first thing he did was the Civilian Conservation Corps, and by the end of March, there were already 100,000 young men at work in the Conservation Corps camps. Apparently, Frank White was in the Conservation yes. Corps. Yes. You'll have to ask him about that. <laughs> so, uh, but within six months, a half a million young men between the ages of 18 and 25 were at work on conservation projects, planting trees, dealing with soil erosion, uh, working on state and federal land all over the country and this, within six months or so of, um, of Roosevelt being uh, inaugurated. They got paid $30 a month. Now, they had room and board because they all lived in these camps. But of that $30 a month, they got to keep $5. And it was spent in the towns, you know, where they lived. The soft coat keepers, I'm sure, were happy about that. The other $25 got sent to their home families so that their families at home were also insured of a little bit of income. And that was how the Civilian Conservation Corps worked. Of course, with the, by around 1935, the Works Progress Administration gets set up, and this puts millions more people to work. And this map shows you all the different sites where the WPA had a project in northern New York. Each one of these, most of these little black dots, those are road improvement programs. Maybe it was a bridge that was replaced, maybe it was a road that was widened, maybe it was pavement that was added finally in 1935 or 1938. But most of those black dots all relate to road improvement projects. But there were a couple of big projects that happened up here in northern New York. Both the state schools in Canton and in Potsdam received the money and hired local people to build new athletic fields for both of the campuses. The other thing that happened, St. Lawrence County got an airport, and this was in Messina. Up to that time, if you had an airplane, you found a farmer to lease some ground from, or maybe you owned a piece of property. The county didn't have an airport. Thanks to the Works Progress Administration, they got an airport. Messina got a fine new town hall the next time you drive past that. That was a WPA project. In Potsdam, the Civic Center Library and Museum World Works uh, Progress Administration project. And in Canton, we got a fine new post office downtown. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, on the national level, we've got lots of people back at work, but unemployment is still pretty high. Um, James Farley, who was then the Postmaster General of the country, he was trying to come up with an idea that wasn't going to cost a lot of money because obviously a lot of the government's money was tied up in all of these different projects. But he did come up with an idea and Roosevelt thought it would work too. What he wanted to do was a public relations campaign. There would be a celebration of the 20th anniversary of the first airmail flight. And uh, all that the government would have to do, pretty much, was pay for advertising in hundreds, if not a couple thousand, newspapers, large and small, all across the country. And there would also be press releases that would be written to inform the public and also to kind of build excitement for National Airmail Week, the week of May 15th through the 21st of 1938. Now, the country also, the government also agreed to issue a brand new six cent airmail stamp that came out May 15th. And they decided that they would encourage every single citizen in the United States to mail just one airmail letter. Six cents. You know, surely you can come up with six cents. Mail an airmail letter or arrange to have somebody send you an airmail letter. The youth were going to get involved, too, uh, in the schools. The grade school children had a poster competition. And uh, there was also, for the high school students, an essay writing contest. And the essay's topic was Wings Across America. Every state would have one or two winners of the essay contest. And those winners would be flown to Washington, DC, to take part in the national uh, celebration of National Airmail Week. Every town in the U.S. was invited to participate in this in a particular way. 
Every town was invited to design a cachet. Basically, it was a little image to be stamped or printed on the front of every envelope that had an airmail stamp and that was mailed during the, that week in May between the 15th and the 21st. And you could do anything you wanted with this cachet. A town could decide that they wanted to highlight a particularly important person who lived there. Maybe there was a landmark. Maybe there was a big event that happened in their town. They could make up any design they wanted to and put it on an envelope that would be used only for airmail, only during National Airmail Week. So the towns responded. Um, and in fact, they, they, they really loved this whole concept. So here's a town in California, the Citrus and Residential District. In Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, their stamp celebrated National Airmail Week because they also laid claim to the very first air voyage in America at Philadelphia in January of 1793. Now, I, I might be off on this, but this may have been actually the very first um, airmail uh, that happened because in 1793, this flight, the president gave the person in the uh, basket and then a, a mail, a, a letter to give to the farmer in whose field he landed. So technically, that was probably the first airmail. But anyway, they were also, Philadelphia was also very important in that very first um, airmail flight between New York, Philadelphia, and Washington. And this is the airmail cover that was used in Washington, D.C., commemorating National Airmail Week. And you'll notice this one has a signature from the postmaster in, um, in Washington, D.C. Not the postmaster general, just the, the city's postmaster. Town, oh, and the most exciting event of the week, how could I forget this? The most exciting event was going to be the day where airmail was flown in from every corner of every state. And the, uh, the postmaster general was going to deputize pilots as one day only volunteers, employees of the postal department. So this was the big event, was airmail being flown in from all over the country. <coughs> Towns got pretty excited about this. You know, everybody was looking for something that wasn't the depression, right, to, to enjoy. <laughs> Nearly 10,000 towns designed their own caches. Um, there were over 1,700 pilots that agreed to volunteer their services that day. And those 1,700 pilots included 43 women and one black pilot. So for the first time, one black pilot and 43 women flew the airmail for the United States government. And that was in 1938. Uh, our county's part in this whole celebration. This is what the, the rest of the talk is going to be about. Among the papers uh, in the Dwight Church collection was a draft of a memoir that, at, that, uh, that Dwight Church wrote for Atwood Manley, who was the publisher of the St. Lawrence County, uh, St. Lawrence Plain Dealer newspaper in Canton. He wrote an essay that talked about um, what he did on the day of the flight. And, uh, and about his part in it. And in fact, that letter is uh, one of the, the taller, I, one of the items, oh, I, it's hanging up there on the wall um, to the left. That is the original essay that, that, uh, that Dwight wrote for Adam Manley. So I decided to take parts of that essay and put it together with all the newspaper coverage, all the many little newspapers here in the county to kind of piece together what happened leading up to National Airmail Week, during the week, and after the week. So that we're just going to be diving into all these different things and kind of weaving them together. Um, Dwight remembered that it was in early March that the post office reached out to him about flying the mail from St. Lawrence County. They wanted him to pick up mail in five places. He was going to take Canton's mail, uh, Potsdam, he was going to go to Messina, Ogdensburg, go to Governor, and then he was going to go south to Syracuse, where pilots from this region would be meeting up and moving the mail onto the larger planes. So Dwight agreed on one condition. They could only have 25 pounds of mail per town, no more. No more than 25 pounds. Now the plane that Dwight was using 
was this lovely little monosport airplane. This was originally designed as a racing airplane. And uh, so, about a 100 horsepower engine. It held two people. It had a small compartment behind the seats where you could put something about the size of a suitcase. The payload for this plane was somewhere around 250 pounds. And I hate to say it, but I think that that included the weight of the pilot. My grandfather was tall and slender. Good thing. So. This was the plane he was going to use, and he knew that if he only got 25 pounds of mail from these five towns, he would still be okay. So they said, all right. I never flew in my life. No? Okay. <laughs> um, as the date got closer, several other postmasters contacted Dwight about picking up the mail in their towns, and he agreed he was going to stop in Hammond. He was going to stop out in Alexandria Bay, and he was going to stop in Lowville, and then head south. So he agreed to take on those planes too, but he explained, no more than 25 pounds. So kids got to work on their posters for, for the, um, for, to celebrate National Airmail Week. And the high school kids started working on their essays. Now those essays had to be completed before the beginning of May, when they were judged here on the local level. The very best essays were sent on into Albany, where they were judged on the statewide level. And did I mention that the winners of the essay contest would get flown to Washington, D.C.? I did. Okay, good. Uh, around here, too, besides all that, caches were being designed by many of the towns. This is the cache from Canton. I'm going to give you the slightly blown up uh, view of it. On the, the main part of the cache is an image of the brand new post office. It had only been open a year or less. National Air Mail Week, Special Air Mail Flight, up here at the top, the home of Governor Silas Wright, one of Canton's claim to fame. Down here at the bottom, it mentions both St. Lawrence University and the State School of Agriculture. And underneath here, it says Canton, New York, post office established 1804, federal building erected 1937. So that was the Canton cache. In Potsdam, I've seen a couple of different pictures. There was this one that appeared in the newspaper, Potsdam listed as the gateway to the Adirondacks. The image that we found on an envelope that actually got mailed out doesn't mention the Adirondacks, but it's pretty clear that it's definitely the foothills to somewhere. The stagecoach here says um, U.S. mail across the bottom in 1807 when their post office got opened up. And then, of course, up at the top, a few years later, 1938, it's flying out of Potsdam in an airplane. This, this cover, we have a copy of this over there, and you have to take a look at this cover. It looks pretty boring, and it's nice, and it's cool. Messina, New York, world's largest producer of aluminum, the metal that flies, which is really quite wonderful. But the cool thing about this, it's not just gray with black printing on it. That's actually aluminum. They use aluminum paint to, to print this image on the envelopes. And uh, it, it really, it's quite beautiful, and we have a copy of it over there, so make sure you take a look at that. In Ogdensburg, their claim to fame was that they were the gateway to the proposed St. Lawrence Deep Waterway. This is in 1938. The St. Lawrence Seaway never opened up until, what, 1959 or 1960? But already in 1938, the plans are concrete enough that Ogdensburg is going to go out on a limb and be the gateway to the St. Lawrence Deep Waterway, what we know as the St. Lawrence Seaway. Also, they wanted to let you know that they were the logical place to enter Canada. And all sorts of very important things that they're first in retail sales among the seven northernmost counties in New York State. So they, the, the Chamber of Commerce, prominently displayed down there, was definitely behind, um, behind this one. Uh, there were a lot of other things that happened around this area just before National Air Mail Week got underway. There was a question box that was put up in Collins Market. This was a store in Parisville. And the postmaster there said, listen, leave your questions about air mail for me. I'll answer them at a program on May 12th. So on May 12th, the Parisville uh, postmaster had a whole program. This is Elsie Brinsey, who was the postmaster. And I love this. During the afternoon and evening, they had up a display of all the posters that the kids drew in school. I'm sure that they had copies of the essay. 
But my favorite thing is the fact that they did a talk, of course, about airmail. But down here at the bottom, it says, um, the kitchen band, especially pleased with real music on instruments ordinarily considered anything but musical. <laughs> so that was your treat in Parrishville on May 12th of 1938. <laughs> Colton also decided that they were going to have a program. This one sounds a lot more serious. Lionel Hepburn uh, had a program. It featured the Colton High School Band. A group called the Civic Singers came in. And they had exhibits of model airplanes. And the postmaster will speak on what the postal department and airmail means to you. And everyone was welcome to show up for that in the town hall. Messina did a slightly different thing. They decided to do a model airplane building contest. And so the kids were directed to bring their model airplanes down to the post office with it, where they were going to be on display, which is really quite wonderful when you think about it. The other thing that the post office was going to do that day was have a display of all the covers used by post offices in this area for the National Observance of Airplane Transportation. What I wouldn't give to take a look at that exhibit because we have those four examples of local uh, caches, but you know what? Parrishville might have had, had a cache. I mean, they could have had one printed up. They probably would have taken the mail into Potsdam and had it flown out that way. Uh, Colton might have had a cache. I don't know. These things are sitting in people's scrapbooks. <sighs> they may be out there. I was trying to come up with the caches from, uh, from the Loudville area because they, I found newspaper descriptions of what the caches looked like. But when I contacted the historians there, I, I didn't, they either didn't get an answer back or in the case of um, the Thousand Islands, the, uh, the newspaper there, the Thousand Islands Sun, there was a big fire in the, in the 1970s. All the back issues of the newspaper went up in flames. Gone. So you know, any articles, any pictures of the cachet, gone. And nothing, nothing, uh, nothing has shown up. So you know, if you ever go through a note through somebody's your grandma's scrapbook, you know, keep an eye out for this. Um, so Messina, so I would give anything to be able to take a look at that display. And finally, St. Lawrence University's experimental radio station, WCAD, even did a short little program. They had a group of women come in from Parrishville and set up in the studio. Three of them sang a song, Mrs. Harry Foster, Mrs. Floyd Fenner, and Mrs. Clark Chittenden, Mrs. Faye Duffy at the piano accompanying, uh, which was very good, apparently. And the friends and neighbors of Mrs. W.O. Daniels were very proud of her and the interesting talk they gave. And you know, this program was done live and in person. They didn't just put it on a tape and play it back when they wanted to. Those folks showed up at WCAD's studio and, and did this. The newspaper coverage really started to ramp up the week before the big event. Big mail volume expected. The article goes on to say, Messina Post Office will have a miniature Christmas rush Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Oh, and also I wanted to mention these two pictures. This was part of the pre one of the press releases that the government put out for National Air Mail Week. Here's an image of what was flying the mail in 1918 Here's the image of what was flying the mail in 1938. Big difference. From Ogdensburg, the uh, Ogdensburg Journal, the day before, residents thrilled over first airmail flight here. And the article reads, anxious ears will be turned in the direction of Canton for the first sign of a droning monotone that will usher in the plane piloted under the experienced hand of D.P. Church. Yeah. In Governor, things were a little more understated, uh, but this is from the Tribune Press newspaper of Governor, and it mentions here that local residents interested in sending mail requested to deposit uh, before 8.30, and if you wanted to go, and greet the plane when it came in, go out to Carl Randall's farm <laughs> on the Somerville Road. That's where you can meet up with that. Uh, also in Messina, from the Messina Observer paper, <laughs> thousands of letters to be sent. My favorite, letter deluge expected for airmail week. It's very exciting. And from the Canton uh, Commercial Advertiser newspaper, this headline, do not fail to have a letter in Canton's airmail on Thursday. 
And one last item here, this is from the Ogdensburg Journal, but for the Canton readers, Canton plants are rousing send-off. And you know what? We're going on to that send-off. The last time we saw Dwight Church this morning, he had just circled the airfield in Canton, everybody waved, and he headed south towards Governor. You know, Dwight had no trouble navigating the landscape here in this county. Part of his business as a photographer involved taking aerial pictures. Yeah. And um, he called them sky views, but he did aerial photography of college campuses, of businesses, of people's camps, rivers, lakes. So he knew St. Lawrence County like the back of his hand. No trouble navigating for this man. Um, he headed down towards Governor, and the paper has this description. The roar of the monoplane of D.P. Church, Canton Aviator, was heard over the village at about 8.30 a.m., and shortly afterward, the silver ship dropped to a landing on the Carl Randall farm. Now, it only took a few minutes for, uh, for Dwight to turn off the plane, receive the bag of airmail, 150 letters, that was well below 25 pounds, much to his delight, I'm sure, and sign a few papers, get back in the plane, start it back up again, and head up, this time, to the Peck Farm in Potsdam. You're going to notice that I'm talking an awful lot about farmers' fields for the next few minutes. The only actual airport in St. Lawrence County was under construction. So in the case of St. Lawrence County, and in the case of those 1,700 pilots who were doing the exact same thing that Dwight was doing this morning, they were all landing on prearranged farmer's fields. And if there wasn't a suitable field for them to use in whatever corner of the country they were in, it, uh, some of the articles I read said that they closed down roadways for the amount of time that it took for the pilot to come in, land his plane, pick up his airmail, and head on out. So that was one method that they did. But yeah, you're going to hear a lot of farmers' names because that's where people were landing planes. So it was in the Peck Farm. And I'm sorry, this is a, well, this is a scanned photograph, but that's the Peck Farm. <laughs> that's Dwight's plane. Messina was the next stop. And, uh, oh, that's the audience for one. Messina was the next stop. And, and you know, so far, Dwight was running right on time. and. When he arrived in Messina, he discovered he was in for a surprise. This is what he wrote. They were waiting for me with a big, long bag, full and heavy. He thought it weighed about 75 pounds. I told them it was badly overweight. There didn't seem to be much I could do about it, so we loaded it in. By now, I was well crowded. And all he had was, uh, you know, the mail from, what? Canton, that was about 21 pounds of mail. Whatever he picked up in Governor, which was pretty lightweight, they didn't tell us how much mail he picked up in Pottstown, but here in Messina, oof, big bag. He said I was by now well crowded. Now at this point, navigating was very easy. All I had to do was follow the St. Lawrence River upstream. His next stop was going to be in Ogdensburg. Great excitement. This is from the Ogdensburg Advanced News. And this is uh, Dwight's memory of landing there, which I have to remind you that this airport was actually still under construction. And Dwight had to, well, not Dwight, actually the officials in Ogdensburg had to contact the WPA themselves and say, listen, we'd really like to use this airport. Is there something you can do to get things moving? And so they agreed, and Dwight was technically the very first airplane in and out of the brand new airport in, in Ogdensburg, although it was not at all finished. Dwight's memory says, they were just grading the airport and had smoothed off a strip the day before. I remember it was soft dirt <laughs> and not too smooth. The postmaster and several prominent citizens came tugging a big, long sack about the same size and weight as at Messina. I explained that I was overloaded and that the bag was much too heavy and that I still had two more pickups to make, but they urged me to be a good sport. <laughs> <laughs> so there seemed to be little I could do gracefully, so we loaded it in. So he did manage to get back up in the air and 
The Hammond Advertiser newspaper had this little story. He continued along the St. Lawrence. He came to Hammond, and he landed on the Laidlaw Farm in Hammond. And the folks there were really very excited, actually, about being included. Hammond was the smallest town in the whole state to have air mail service directly in and out of the town that day. So they were pretty thrilled uh, about being a part of this. Um, about a part of, being a part of this. So Dwight gets back in the plane, starts it up, heads on down the St. Lawrence into the Thousand Islands, and he's looking for Wellesley Island and the mail from Alexandria Bay. Ed Noble came up to Wellesley Island every summer as an E.J. Noble, like the hospital buildings all over the place. Ed Noble came up and landed his plane all the time on Wellesley Island. So at least that county had a, a landing strip, and I'm sure Watertown had an airport too. But at any rate, Dwight picked up the mail from Alexandria Bay, and they only had 15 pounds of mail, so that was, that was going to be, that would fit in. So there was just one more stop to make, and then it was, uh, Time to head south to Syracuse. And here is Dwight's memory of arriving in Loudville. There was a light rain falling and an east wind. I was to land on the Verkler Hill farm, almost across from the hospital. They set up an American flag near the middle of the field to give the wind direction. But due to local conditions, obstructions from the farm buildings and trees, the flag indicated a south wind. So I came in from the north and across the field toward the farm buildings. As I leveled off to land, I could only see the tops of the barn ahead and realized it was downhill. Oh. <laughs> At about that instant, the plane dropped to the right due to the extra weight on that side. And then the east wind under the left wing turned the plane sharply around to the right and damaged the wingtip and crumpled the, the, crumpled the right wheel. Ooh. The plane was not going to be flown again that day. Dwight was entirely unhurt, and he knew enough that when he realized what was about to happen, he turned off the gasoline to the engine, so there was no worry about, about a fire starting. But the plane was very badly damaged. You can see, the, you can see that right wheel. Yeah, that's bad. The, uh, the wing had some damage. The next picture shows from the front. The propeller also suffered damage. There was no way that plane was going to fly. So of course, right away, they moved the mail into a truck or a car. They drove it down to Syracuse. Um, and so it, it still managed to, it made the flights going east and west, but not in the way that Dwight wanted it to make. Which is the reason why we had that lunch ticket that got mentioned back a long time ago. We had that lunch ticket because Dwight never got to cash that lunch ticket in, <laughs> uh, sadly, that day. So the Black River Democrat newspaper had read this little article called Unhappy Ending, and, part, and it reads in part, it was an ironic ending to the careful preparations for Lewis County's participation in the airmail celebration. The pilot, too, must feel the injustice of fate that costs him a plane in return for a volunteer service on a government commission. The people that came to admire remained to collect souvenirs. Now, Dwight tried to secure the plane as best he could. I mean, he had to arrange for some sort of a trip to get it back from Loudville, back up to Canton. So he, he did the best he could uh, securing the plane, but after he left, Souvenir hunters came along, and they, they actually cut fabric off of the plane as a souvenir. And part of the propeller went missing, too. Oh my gosh. Now, early in my research about National Air Mail Week, I mean, so early that it was probably in the first 15 or 20 minutes of hitting Google and seeing what came up, I came across a website that had a very concise description of what happened for National Air Mail Week. It mentioned the number of pilots, the number of towns uh, that had cachet.